Yeah, there's a place in the like, it's kind of like the curb is kind of designed for two. Get started. Um, my name is Wade Holland. Mariella. Mariella. Thank you. All right, so we're going to get started. My, my name is Wade Holland. I'm with the uh, Office of the County Executive's County Stat Team, helping facilitate uh, the Vision Zero Equity Task Force. This is our third meeting of the Equity Task Force here in Aspen Hill, location of our newest Hawk Signal, which is why I have it as our cover page. Um, when Alan's Looked at it earlier tonight, and everyone's pushing the button, and now the cars are stopping, so all good stuff so far. Uh, so tonight, um, as part of the Equity Task Force for meeting number three, um, we'll kind of do a recap of where we are, where we're going to start. Uh, for the county's presentation, it'll be about education and outreach. Again, we flipped around uh, enforcement and education and outreach. And things we talk about in education and outreach tonight will actually be relevant for what we talk about for enforcement next week as well, or for a couple weeks. Uh, I'll have a short break, and then we'll do a quick recap of the data from we talked about in meeting number one, in terms of the high injury network and some of the demographics of people who are involved in severe and fatal collisions. And we will have uh, the last basically 45 minutes to really draft the first part of our Vision Zero uh, equity framework, and we'll work on the vision statement. And from that vision statement, we can start drilling down and building the rest of the documents. So building out the, any scorecards, frameworks that will set the um, basically the agenda for the document. So just to recap, where are we at? Meeting number one, we, we talked about introductions to Vision Zero, and we defined equity um, in terms of Vision Zero and what the issues are in terms of equity and uh, severe and fatal collisions. Meeting number two we, that was in Silver Spring, we had uh, talked about engineering and how engineering projects are budgeted and how they are selected. Again, tonight we're going to talk about education and how we do education and outreach in Montgomery County. Um, and finally, we'll have the fourth meeting on enforcement. From there, we'll scurry and open our laptops and write up our draft equity statement for the group after the fourth meeting. We'll have another public review to find the final review of the document. Put a little blue ribbon on it saying it's done, and that will set the framework for the next Vision Zero action plan, which will be the 10-year long-term Vision Zero plan. So in order to build equity into our project, we wanted to get this written first before we do the 10-year plan. I forgot to do introductions, so I'm going to pass the mic around. Uh, so the mic is not audible in here, but we have people online, and this is being recorded. Um, so you can catch it in the, later on as well. Uh, hello, everyone. Veronica Davis with Inspire Green, part of the consultant team. Good evening. Cipriana Eckford. I'm with RK&K and, and part of the consultant team. Hi, I'm May Fan, uh, Planner, also with Inspire Green consultant team. I'm John Hubler, and I work for the Montgomery County Department of Transportation. Uh, Laura Nobler, just just a person, live in Silver Spring downtown. Heidi Coleman, I'm on the uh, Pedestrian, Bicycle, and Traffic Safety Advisory Committee. Jessica Landman, Tacoma Park, I'm on the Safe Roadways Committee in Tacoma Park. Good evening, everyone. I'm Mariela Garcia Kohlberg, a Whedon resident and part of the Whedon Urban District Advisory Council. Melissa Regan, Seneca Valley High School PTSA and Germantown Pedestrian Safety Task Force. Dave 
Steve Helms, uh, PBT SAC. Hi, I'm Marin Hill, um, and I'm a Silver Spring resident and also uh, a planner at Montgomery County Planning Department. Yes. So if you see anything on your walk, bike, bus, or uh, drive home, let me know. I'm working in the Aspen Hill area. I'm Doug Santangelo. I live in uh, Darnstown, Maryland, and I'm not any or any organizations. I'm uh, just retired. Uh, I'm Dan Wilhelm. I'm with Greater Colesville Citizens Association, eastern part of the county. I'm also retired. Uh, my name is Amy Frieder. I live in the Rockville Gaithersburg area, and I'm on the Greater Shady Grove Transportation Management District Advisory Committee. Hi, I'm Danielle Socker. I live in Rockville. I work nearby here. I uh, on the Western Montgomery County Citizens Advisory Board, and I'm an avid cyclist. Hello, I'm Shantae Leverett. I'm a born and raised resident of Montgomery County, parent of a Montgomery County student, as well as on the Board of Social Services, but also just a nosy citizen. Hi, I'm Elizabeth Wallace, resident of Tacoma Park. I serve on the um, Tacoma Park Police Chiefs Advisory Board, member of ACLU Montgomery County. I'm also an Airbnb host, and the reason why I mention that <laughs> is, no, no, I don't want you to come stay with me. No. <laughs> No, it's um, one of my guests almost got hit by a car the other day. And when she came back, she told me, she goes, if you hadn't kept drilling into me to look every time, I wouldn't have looked. And um, so I, it's really important, the education part. She was from a different part of the country, so she didn't have the same goings on about. On purpose. That, is that the Potomac? Is that, was that the pit group? All right. Well, our goal is to hopefully get rid of those conflicts. Um, so tonight's meeting, we won't do that tonight, but we'll get there at some point. Um, so our meeting goals, again, review the county's current education and outreach efforts for traffic safety. Uh, we'll discuss ways, kind of a Q&A session about increasing equity in education campaigns. Again, we're really trying to rethink the way we've done um, education recently, make it more Vision Zero focused. So right now we'll talk about how a lot of the stuff we use is from the nat federal and state governments. So more than kind of either tweak what we get from them or build out something new, you know, we're definitely open to new ideas. And finally, use discussions and data from all the three meetings to develop our value statement. All right, so traffic safety, education, and outreach. So again, this was some, a slide from last uh, our last meeting. Again, of the $117 million in fiscal year 19 allocated to um, operating and capital budgets, uh, about 1% or $663,000 is for education. And that's smaller than actually what's spent in the county. Again, this is just the county's budget. Um, so in the notes right here, you can see that um, the Street Smart campaign, which runs to about $775,000 a year, that's paid for by the state of Maryland, Commonwealth of Virginia, and District of Columbia through the Council of Governments. But we'll talk about Street Smart in a little, in a little bit. So of that $663,000, how do we spend it? Uh, the majority, 66%, is actually in MCDOT. For transportation community outreach, um, the PED safety program, which I think John and I discussed is actually probably somewhat engineering dollars, but it's kind of also pays for staff, so it's a little bit of both. Um, in my office, County Executive's Office, Vision Zero support and outreach um, helps pay for consulting teams, helps pay for the future Vision Zero coordinator, um, and it will have more some extra money for outreach in the future. And our Public Information Office has $50,000 for pedestrian safety education and outreach. Initially, that do they, those dollars were spent on our parking lot safety campaign. Uh, that's kind of been sunset. We kind of ran out what we could do there. Um, kind of found because education on private property is very difficult. A lot of people don't want to actually highlight that their parking lots may be dangerous. Um, so we've kind of taken that 50000 and we're going to look at other ways to make it more Vision Zero focused rather than just pedestrian and parking lot safety. So the first part, I'm going to talk about education is behavior-based campaigns. So 
taking a look quick at the data, these are the pre-crash behaviors for the at-fault party. So this is the at-fault when the um, driver and passengers are severely injured or killed, when the pedestrian is at fault, severely injured or killed, and the cyclists. Um, so very common is distractions. So about over half of the time, the uh, driver is failing to give full time and attention, uh, failing to yield right of way, uh, too fast for conditions, following too closely, so that usually ends up in a rear end collision, and failing to obey traffic signal, the top five for that. Uh, for pedestrians, illegally in roadway, followed by, again, distracted. Three is unknown slash other, and that's kind of just a data quirk because a lot of times when there's a fatality, the preliminary report gets closed and a fatal report gets opened, so some of the fields are not complete in our um, larger data systems. Four, clothing not visible, and five, under the influence of alcohol. And for cyclists, again, this is a small number, so that's, when you see 50%, that's just a few cases. Um, failing to yield right of way, illegally in roadway, fail to obey traffic signal, bicycle violation, which is just kind of a catch all term for um, violating uh, bicycle uh, right of way laws, and then you're going to get a distraction at the bottom. Yeah. Uh, look at the eight companies, uh, real estate police, at least crunching the data. At no point is there a field that says design of highway. <laughs> yeah. So uh, the question was, do we capture design in the acres report? Acres is a system that captures the police use for crashes. Um, so our acres data is modeled after the federal standards, the MUC standards. Um, so we basically try to make it on that. Um, so, well, so they do capture if there's a defect in the roadway, so there's ruts, there's holes, weather. Uh, they capture speed, the speed limit, and and these are just pre-crash behaviors. So if there's roadway defects there, there's also the issue of they're not engineers. So having police officers try and say the roadway is designed wrong is is a judgment. Yeah. Yeah, because they're allowed to. Because you have multiple factors for one crash, so. I've had one that the officer had like a dozen contributing factors. So this is like, it's not a uh, unique count. It's every time that's been used in a crash. Okay. And then bicycles are supposed to be the road. So why are they not supposed to be Yeah, and I'd have to go back and look at the ones that are marked illegally in roadway. That's either the, they may have been against traffic or uh, crossing against the light. Yeah. 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 That is the pedestrian. That's the pedestrian. Yep. Yeah. So it didn't. So it didn't fall in for these ones. It didn't fall into the top five. But actually, when you so when you look at the severe, it's not there. But for the fatal, it's absolutely a huge factor. About half of our um, occupant vehicle occupant deaths are uh, impairment from last year. So it bounces between like 33 and 50 percent a year. So it's absolutely a factor when it comes to the fatal crashes. Yeah, this is fatal and severe. Yeah. These are combined. Right. Right. But that was the last that was the last meeting. Right, so that's kind of where right. So I mean, that's part of what when we do when um, maybe John can chime in a little bit on this. So the crashes tell, like I said, we know what the pre-crash behaviors were, we know what the, the vehicle movement was, we know what all those things are. So then when we start adding them all up for a segment of roadway, we start thinking about, okay, if we constantly have these left turns ending in crashes, then we know that there needs to be some sort of modification. So.
was important because there is um, a data sheet that the students fill out that has you know, different you know, factors to track and it's information about you know, what they said, like attendance, et cetera. But it might be that you could better determine what the growth factors are if it was a more robust form um, <laughs> that captured more information. So that's what I think it's about. Yeah. And Well, I mean, that's, but that's what we think about the three E's together, right? The first, and vision, Division Zero first and foremost is the engineering fixes. That's kind of what we're trying to change in terms of when we say we've adopted Vision Zero, it's getting less from this. But we can't ignore, like, when we see someone texting and driving, that's not, we can't, we can't engineer that out. If they're drinking and driving, we can't engineer that out. Yeah, yeah, and the fatal crashes are. We're gonna have to move on. So we'll one, Heidi. It's not captured a lot. We think it's underreported because basically someone has to say, I was on my cell phone when I crashed. Yeah, they don't want to admit it. And a lot of times, even in a fatal crash, you have to have some sort of evidence to even go get the records that they were on their phone. So it's uh, they don't make it easy. Right, so. John, you want to? Just to speak to what Dave was saying, when they fill out these reports, the purpose of the report is that within the crash, they're identifying the at-fault party. And what you're saying is, you know, well, maybe the engineer is part of that at-fault system. But that that is determined in a different process, the one we described at the last meeting, where we look at the crash data, the locations, the type of crash, an angle crash, a T-bone, T something like that. And we have the heat maps that we put out, we have the high injury network, and we do identify those things, but that's not what this does. This does not identify those things. Last one. Just to these, this is Montgomery County Police Department data. Yeah. So this data includes Rockville and Gaithersburg, but does not include Tacoma Park. We're working on adding Tacoma Park to our data frame because because of the history of Tacoma Park, they were never integrated with our systems back when we were integrated with Rockville and Gaithersburg, so we'll be adding their data in the future. Seatbelt use. This is a thing, you think everyone wears seatbelts, right? Most people do. Um, this is from NHTSA's data. Um, Maryland drivers uh, obs are observed wearing their seatbelts 92% of the time. It's really high. That's really a hard thing to nudge. When we actually look at the serious injury levels, it drops very similar. 13% are not wearing their seatbelt. Seatbelt use is not recorded as being on. But for fatal injuries, 44% are not wearing a seatbelt. So we have this really small amount of people making a very disproportionate amount of our crashes. And that's actually very typical we see across the state of Maryland and, and nationwide we see that same number. So when we think about education, you know, most people are wearing their seatbelts. We, we have 92%, so trying to get you know, that last 8% that's being killed when they're not wearing their seatbelts, um, you know, it's, and they, something they talk about, but some of those stats that really kind of shocks you when you think about it, of how that small percentage makes it such a disproportionate part of our fatal, fatalities, but it makes sense, seatbelts save lives. Yeah, so the question was about rear seats. So um, 
I'm thinking of a crash we had last year where there was one person in the passenger, one person in the rear that were ejected and were killed on site. So that's part of it. I know in the state of Maryland, it is not a primary enforcement of rear seats. So they can get the driver, they can't get the passengers. Yeah. And to add to that, NHTSA looked at some of the data about who, who those people were that were observed not wearing the seatbelts at kind of 10 to 8%. Um, so males more than females. Again, we learned from other data in the first meeting, men are dumb. Don't let them drive. Women, drive your men around. Um, African Americans uh, had slightly lower rates than the rest of the population. And people ages 16 to 24, and actually people driving alone versus with passengers are more likely to not wear their seatbelt. So how do we do education enforcement? Um, a lot of this, again, like I mentioned early on, is really driven by um, NHTSA and the state of Maryland's State Highway Safety Office. So we have this calendar that we use from NHTSA. It comes out every year. Uh, things are largely in the same spot every year. Um, so again, on the holidays, as you can imagine, we do, there's a lot of education around uh, drive sober, get pulled over. Uh, November, a lot of things about buckling up, since a lot of people are driving on the roads for Thanksgiving. Uh, during May, it's Motorcycle Safety and Bicycle Safety Month. Um, let's see. And February, again, Super Bowl, so they have impaired driving. October, going back to and September, you have passenger safety and bus safety. So that's the kind of schedule that we use. Um, it kind of gives us a way to really multiply the power of our uh, education, because when we're sending out messages, we're getting messages out from the state and the, the federal level. We're getting that. Okay, and it's not on the calendar. And then well, this is cut off. The time, people are drowsy. You know, we need to be situationally aware of that. So every every year at the time change, we have a pedestrian safety launch event, uh, usually the week before, or week after. So like last fall, we hosted in Silver Spring for the beginning of the Street Smart kickoff, which is Street Smart again is our pedestrian safety enforcement and education for the region. So we get resources from NHTSA. This is from NHTSA's site. Anyone can go to it. It's the trafficsafety.gov. Trafficsafetymarketing.gov. It's a government one, so it has to be a longer URL always. So the different topics, again, these kind of all align with the uh, topics that are on the calendar. So anyone uh, at any level can actually just go on here, download the toolkit, get the messages, and send them out on social media or um, you know, post them in the work site. Yeah. Of, of, of crash and the, 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 I guess the, the rationale or reason for the crash. Do you have that time phase to look at um, when the incidents are occurring in the county? You know, do we have a you know, concentration during certain periods of the year? Yeah, I don't have it in this presentation, but that's a good question. The question was, do we have these kind of time phase? So we know around the holidays, there's a lot of drinking and driving. That's why we really hammer basically Thanksgiving all the way to New Year's. We have a lot of enforcement, a lot of education from both NHTSA. They have a lot of commercials that run during that time. Um, really enjoyed the ones this year about, hey, buddy, you better hang up your keys. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so when we, so that's why we have the Street Smart kickoff in the spring and, and the uh, fall. And bicycling, because it gets warmer in May, so that's why this bicycle, bike to work month and all that good stuff. Yeah. And again, so the state of Maryland has a towards zero death plan where the Montgomery County is part of. So they also provide, um, through their resources, kind of hitting on these top ones. Again, we talked about distracted driving, impaired driving, aggressive driving, seat belts, and car seats. Um, if you know anyone who has a baby coming up soon um, and needs to learn how to do a car seat, we sponsor that monthly um, with Fitzgerald Auto Mall. And also, you can also get your car seats installed by a fire rescue person by appointments if you call 311. Just put a plug in for that. They're a great service. Um, again, pedestrian safety and motorcycle safety, because motorcyclists are also a very vulnerable group that make up a disproportionate amount of our fatalities on the roadway. Is there a second page of these? That's it. So, yeah. Well, this is just saying. Oh, I have a slide on that. Is that part of the county? So this is yeah. Maryland. Oh, 
Yeah. So these are just resources that basically we use in the county from our friends at the state to send out messages about pedestrian safety, seatbelts, distracted driving. So they give us pre-built um, images. They give us pre-built stats, um, press releases that we can use at the county level, kind of tweak it to our use. It's kind of... Um, so obviously social media is becoming a larger and larger part of our education campaign. We're really starting to figure out, right now we kind of just send out general tweets. We're trying to really get this better to do more focused. Um, so I'm trying to hire some Russians to send some messages. They're apparently really good at it. Um, <laughs> so we're very active on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and Snapchat. Because I'm sure if you have any younger kids, they don't use Facebook. My sister doesn't use Facebook. It's all Instagram and Snapchat. Um, so here's some images from uh, Twitter. Um, I mean, actually, these are all from Twitter from different places. So we have Montgomery County Fire, Montgomery County Police, our Safe Routes School Program, and the Montgomery County Vision Zero Program. Uh, so you'll see this one in the upper left. That's Zeal the Zebra. That is our branded um, safety mascot for Safe Routes School and pedestrian safety. So you'll see him out and about. I don't know if John's ever. You haven't, you haven't been inside it? <laughs> so that's what we do that. And we actually found, just looking at some of our stats on the Vision Zero um, Twitter account, engagement was highest usually with posting with images. So again, text versus images. Images get more um, impressions. Uh, and video as well. Usually when you tie it to an upcoming event or holiday, so we make some Saint, like St. Patrick's Day, we got a lot of hits because we were talking about um, impairments. So people were clicking and sharing that message. And if we mention penalties as well, so you see like down here at the Montgomery County Police, you know, we do um, sobriety checkpoints on the weekends or during holidays. So we get that message out beforehand saying, hey, we're going to be on the road with you. And this is also an example up here. This is from the state's um, toolkit. So example of we're kind of starting to do more targeted campaigns. So uh, social media allows you for cheaper to really reach the audience you intend to. So when we talk about some of the demographics later on. We'll recap some of the data from meeting one. We can show uh, you know potentially different messages we could share with folks. So we think about equity in education. You know what kind of messages should we be sending? How to make sure it's done equitably? So this is an example of a Snapchat ad that we sent out when we were advertising for the um, Vision Zero Youth Ambassador Program. So when we got the data back from them, we actually saw that you know we we're obviously targeting high school students. So we got data back from Snapchat about uh, how many men and women either clicked the link or how many people like saw it for impressions. So we saw overall there were almost 600 women and 300. I can't read. And about 222 uh, high school age males that clicked on it. So we can see that our ad was being seen by. Uh, the audience we wanted to reach out to. Yeah, I'd have to go ask because um, this is actually done through our a partnership with Noise. So, John, do you know if any? Yeah, she's not. Yeah, she's not here tonight. Yeah, she's she's everywhere. I was gonna give her kudos tonight because she was actually one of the the kids that pushed for not kids, young adults, that pushed for expanding buses, uh, kids ride free. So she worked with the council and actually got it all year round. So kudos to her. Yeah. yeah, those kids, the kids here make me tired. They're very very active. So Street Smart. So before, if you ever remember the Tired Faces campaign, that was around for, I don't know, about a decade. Um, so Street Smart, which again is by the Council of Governments, paid for by the states and the District of Columbia. We've now changed to the Shattered Lives campaign. Um, so again, there's toolkits online at bstreetsmart.net. We use them in the county as part of our enforcement and education. The Main times are April and November when we have the kickoff for the education and enforcement. That's also when Street Smart's paying for ads on radio, Pandora, um, on gas pump toppers. They're trying to target drivers. So here's some messages about you know three feet for cyclists, 
stop for people when crossing, and then one targeted message at pedestrian about using crosswalks. So there's variable messages. Um, they all kind of have the same motif with the broken glass saying, you know, your life is fragile. Um, so this is one of the few campaigns that I, we have where there's an evaluation done every year. So uh, basically $2.9 million value of earned, paid, and donated media value on a $775,000 budget. They do a pre and post survey for each wave. So they have people before, then the wave happens in the spring and fall, and then they survey them afterwards. So 52% of survey respondents recalled seeing Shattered Lives campaign. They actually saw it mostly on TV news. So that's why we always make sure to do the big kickoff with police and uh, elected officials. They usually get the, the news uh, involved where people get that message out about pedestrian safety. About 34% were generally aware of the Street Smart program, which actually found that when they switched between the, the tired faces and the Shattered Lives actually was lower, kind of reset to the first year of the Tired Faces campaign. So it was near about 60, 70% before. So it kind of shows when we switch campaigns, it's hard to switch them every year. You gotta kind of keep with it for a couple of years. Um, for drivers, they found a 10% 10 percentage point increase in reporting knowledge of bike and safety laws pre and post. So not a lot, but some improvement. And here, donated media is largely, um, it's like we as Montgomery County pay for having the ads on buses. So that's kind of the donated media that they get for Street Smart. Yeah, I, I mean, I'm not, I haven't seen. It's still, it's still reporting, I think they're younger. Yeah, I mean, there's always that problem, right? Where I say, like, I feel like I'd have to look at the survey question. I'm not sure uh, what the exact survey question is, but again, people usually self report good behavior when you're there asked about it. But, but what about, like, you're generally aware of the Street Smart program or the Tired Faces program, so was I. But then the question is, how did it affect the drivers? Mm hmm. Yeah, and that's what that's really what's tricky when we talk about. Um, they mentioned, but like NITS also has this document called kind of like a what works document for like what's effective. And education is really hard to evaluate, right? Because we can say you saw it, you thought about it, we asked you about it, but when you you know the surveyor goes away, are you better off? And that's why a lot of times NITSA will say, you know, this is untested or unverified if this education method works. So that's why we don't really you know spend a lot of money on it because. There's things that you can try, you can, and you know may not be effective, and it's hard to really measure the impact. Versus an engineering camp, engineering change to a roadway, you can measure pre-post very easily. In a education campaign, pre-post is fairly difficult. Yeah. Yeah. As well as when you have those um, those posters up, you know, now you have the scan capability. You could have some sort of uh, scan thing to get people involved. Mm -hmm. Like scan this, receive this, scan this, share it. That lets you know that they saw it. Mm -hmm. Then they took a second action. You have to give them an action. Yeah. An give them an action. Okay. Yeah, that's a good point. So the the discussion was for the recording is that uh, can we get information from insurance about the kind of drive wise, drive safe uh, rewards programs? I don't know. They're probably it's all proprietary information. We have been in discussions with an insurance company that sponsors a contest, um, but the lawyers are involved and they don't like the contract term, so it may fall apart. Um, but it, but it would basically. Yeah, because this program is actually like basically because they put their branding, this company puts their branding on it, they pay for all of it and turning the surveying, data collection, app development, promotion, and all that. But yeah, like I said, we're, other cities have done it. You can probably find it online because I don't, can't mention it because we haven't entered any agreement. But uh, it's exactly what you're talking about. And they actually collect data about speed reductions, distraction, because they're tracking your phone because you have an app on your phone to be in the contest. So you can see how often they're touching their phone while they're driving. Can you go back to the pictures? What I notice here is I'm going to notice that Shattered Lives poster, the actual information 
Right. So, yeah, the comment was that the actual safety message, kind of the news you can use part, is very small, hard to read. So you see the speeding lives shatter, but you don't really see the stop for people crossing. We also had comments that it looks like bullets were shot at a window. So <laughs> that's a, yeah. And I think when they're horizontal, like on the buses, the message looks a little bit larger. But like I said, it's still smaller, much smaller than the live shatter kind of taglines. So you're saying that the, the picture doesn't really match the message, what you're saying there? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I have seen the noodles, though. And we're actually testing in the state of Maryland. Our friends in Anne Arundel County are testing the C3 feet tool, where the, the officer can be on the bicycle, and he has a basic GoPro and a LiDAR radar, and they can measure when people pass too close. Yeah, I mean, that also would be a great thing for like a group like Patone Peddlers or other. They can kind of grab grab some media. And I mean, earned media is a big thing. So we talk about, we had a big distraction campaign in the first year of Vision Zero. We got a ton of free media. We also had Spanish because of the news the coverage. Um, we found it really effective. The media loves when they do enforcement in the background. They show up more. So we had pretty much every ma major channel plus Univision show up, which was huge because we had a lot of people talking about distracted driving and the facts behind it. Yeah. Yeah, and well, that's why the pilot and Aaron Ronald is really important because we're kind of learning, like, they're also kind of talking to about how the courts can use that information. Um, they haven't tried doing any citations with it yet. It's been like a, education. They have an iPad and they show the driver how close they were and what how close they passed. Um, so they're kind of the pilot, the guinea pig for this, and then ideally the rest of the state and bike uh, patrols can start using it. So we have street teams. Again, these are largely contracted street teams with idle time advertising and Sharp and Company. Um, so here's out on Georgia Avenue. Um, you can see on the back these signs are these signs, again, using the street smart images. Uh, the street teams will also interact with folks. So they see someone crossing or not pushing the button, uh, crossing the middle. They'll talk about, hey, you know, what did you see? What did you do? Uh, they'll also usually hand out pamphlets or swag as well on the streets. So this event uh, is in Wheaton outside the mall uh, where we're uh, a couple weeks ago, and handing out swag and getting people on what they see as safety in Wheaton. So after every, every event, they track attendance, uh, staff that was there, how many giveaways they had, and when they have engagements with the folks, what are they saying about the area for safety, for what their issues are. So we kind of collect that feedback as well, these events. The um, yeah, so we do a lot of these events, and uh, some of them are targeted in areas where we have 
um, a history of crashes. So uh, this Wheaton one, and we actually did a lot of Wheaton events in the last half year because there was a spate of crashes there in 2018, kind of late summer, fall. And so it was a response to that. And then we also do them proactively, and we'll go to events pretty much anywhere they'll have us. Um, We were up in Germantown a couple weeks ago uh, at an AARP meeting. Um, We're going to be in Bethesda um, in a couple of weeks, wherever there's an opportunity to be an essential business district or an area where we have a request from a community or we know there's a need based on crash history, we'll go there. And the giveaways are a lot of times um, either it's it's an informational giveaway and actually brought examples for people to look at on that back table of just some of the stuff that we use. And some of it is informational pamphlets about crosswalks or how to you know walk or bike safely some of it is actual reflective gear that you can wear or put on your bike or like a light that you can put on the back of your bike or on your handlebar uh, i think we we've given out helmets we've given out all it's it's a, a swath of things um and it's it's usually um tailored to that situation of okay is, is it pedestrian incidents uh is it bike crashes what is going on there and then what what can we deliver to the people Most of it is in pretty garish colors because the idea is that it is being seen. Um, But the messaging, and this tags into the equity part of it, a lot of times um, is tailored so getting things at Amharic for downtown Silver Spring. Or when we were doing these Wheaton outreach, the street teams that were there were bilingual, and we were giving out handouts that had one side in English and one side in Spanish. So that's kind of how we're trying to tackle that currently in addition to you were talking about kind of the Univision and Telemundo and, and getting them on board. And I will say that largely when we talk about equity, we really only do things in English and Spanish. Also our federal and state partners, a lot of their stuff is English, Spanish. So we um, haven't worked on getting other languages yet, but that could be something we could put as part of the equity task force notes as well. So hands were here first. Yeah. 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 No, that's a great question. So it's, you know, what do we do to meet people where they are? And in addition to tabling, and obviously with the table, you're not mobile, we do send out street teams to go to those locations. Um, In Wheaton, last year we did it, where there's a mid-block crossing that gets a lot of heavy crossing. Um, There's talks about if we can do a mid-block crossing or if we can install a pedestrian signal at a nearby intersection. Mm, I'm getting a yes. And, and right, a point of interest. Yeah, yeah. And that's where 
Yeah. So, so one of, so one of the things we did is is we went and we had the street teams go to the people and basically say, you know, did you know that you crossed unsafely? And for the moment, ignoring the illegal potential of it and saying, did you cross unsafely? Did you know that? And you'll get a yes or no. And, well, why did you do that? And then they mentioned, oh, there's a desire line. There's a point of interest. There's my favorite restaurant. A desire line. Yeah. So bet between where I'm coming from and where I'm going, I'm going to take A to B. It doesn't matter if there's six lanes of cars or what. Um, and the way we do it is so we have them ask those questions to kind of engage the mind. And we'll, we did that uh, in Wheaton for about four weeks. We tag team back and forth with State Highway. They have street teams, too, and the Mid-County Regional Service Center has their red shirts. And then we follow it up with enforcement after that. So basically, we're out there for four weeks saying, did you know what you did was unsafe? Why did you do it? Some people engage it. Yeah, yeah. But why, why did that? <laughs> I mean, it, it varies. Um, but, but, yeah, a lot of... Uh, the, yeah, it, it, it's because I wanted to get there. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, so we can actually, I'm going to jump ahead for time. Here's our virtual rally contest. That was kind of fun. Again, this is the street team also engaging with the driver. So it's a virtual rally contest where they are given different uh, – challenges to left turns straight right turns against cyclists and pedestrians and if they don't see the pedestrian uh it, you know obviously gets against the score and they can talk about with the person in the vr headset uh what they missed so safe routes to school is probably our biggest education item um so we are going to so, we currently have a vacant safe route to school coordinator but it's getting filled soon imminently ooh, great i have so much thing for that person um, so this is we're, there's education and engineering portion to Safe Route School. We're just talking about the education portion tonight. So walking school buses, walk to school day, park and walk, where you get some parents to park and walk their kids to the school instead of waiting in a line forever. Uh, bike rodeo, which is where we bring a bicycle trailer and have cycling, uh, basically teach cycling, safe cycling practices, and a bike train. So that's the same with the walk train. You have kids that can set up and ride together. So also our bigger events are in the, uh, again, the spring and fall, we have walk to school and bike to school. Um, not every school participates. We had about 50 schools participate in walk to school every year. And between six and 12 schools participate in bike to school day each year. statement yes so John quickly talk about the engineering part of it so there's two sides of the program there's the education side which we're talking about this week and then I probably skipped it last week and I apologize there is an engineering side of the safe routes to school program there's also uh, Lucy Nair runs the Tacoma Park safe routes to school program and I'm not sure um, I, I know she does a lot of the education side of it. I don't know if they also have an engineering side of it, but we will we go and look at. Um, so there, there's basically been two sweeps for all the schools in the county. We've got about 200 Montgomery County public schools, um, about 25 are in municipalities, and so DOT is not in charge of those roadways. So we have about 175 that are left to us. We did an initial assessment where we looked at immediate school frontage, access to the school, the parent loops, the bus loops, um, and that started about 15 years ago now and ended seven or eight years ago. Um, and then we did those improvements, and then now we're starting the second round of assessments for the engineering side of the Safe Routes to School program. Um, Melissa Regan's been at a bunch of these meetings where we talk about it, so sorry for, for hearing this for the third um, time. And we'll go out and we'll look at the entire walk zone. So as defined by MCPS, there's a walking area for each school. Sometimes it's just 
that street. Sometimes it's up to a half mile radius for some high schools, including crossing state roadways. And so we'll do a walk um, audit and we'll go out and identify We'll go out and identify what the needs are and where the safety issues are. And then we'll coordinate with the corresponding agency. 95% of the time it's us, but sometimes it'll be um, state highway administration or park and planning if it's a park road. And then um, a lot of the work also will be on MCPS's property. And we, we can't, you know, that's their property. So we'll inform them of those needs. We'll inform state highway and inform park and planning, whatever. Um, and then we'll take care of what is within DOTs right away in terms of ADA compliance, um, walking routes. Sometimes it gets into more intermediate and long-term items. Sidewalks aren't something that we can just go in and plop in. There's a process that's required where community engagement is involved and you have to get a certain amount of votes and stuff like that. Um, but that program is is going on now and um, we've we've started doing it you know there's 175 or starting you know it's the first bite um, and in FY19 I think we've got about like somewhere between 12 and 15 of those studies and looking at doing uh, we have a crew contracted to go out and do that work they always seem to push it to the last week before school starts but as long as it's done before school starts we're glad All right, thank you so much. Have a good night. We're getting to that one. We're getting to that one. So, next slide. So, we also do contests with students. Um, so, here's an example. We do a Don't Be Distracted creative contest where students can enter. Uh, there's prizes for an overall winner and also prizes for elementary, middle school, and high school students. So, the lower left is one year for elementary school students where the Flash is, uh, dropped his phone, I guess, and hit his head on the mailbox. And here's one from a student talking about texting while driving. Um, we also have students who do like PSA videos. Uh, they are amazing quality. Uh, John does the review and it's the press. Well, they're amazing quality. Some of them. Yeah. <laughs> they're good though. Clearly good videos. <laughs> um, yeah, one of them, uh, it's on YouTube, which was put out by, I think, Seneca Valley High School. North, Northwest. Northwest, Northwest, Northwest. I'm sorry, Northwest. Yeah. I always get that called. Um, and it's really amazing. Yeah. It's like three and a half, four minutes. Yeah, and it's really good. They featured it on WJLA. And Yeah, the schools, and so like again, this is through MCDOT for the engineering education. It's kind of outside of the school because again, the student, youth ambassadors, the creative contest. When it comes to like what's happening between the bells, you know, that's all MCPS, and they obviously have a lot of requirements that they have to meet. And yeah. Some of the wrong things, though. this age in health, which is body safety. You walk out, I don't know what you want to call it, but you put it in there. Yeah. So some of the education we... High risk tolerance is, is a tough thing to deal with and, and, and uh, indestructible. 
So as Dave was mentioning, we have this on-bike education program that started as part of the Vision Zero um, two-year action plan. So there's John, there's Hans Reamer. And so basically this is a pilot. We worked with the Excel Beyond the Bell, which is a Montgomery County recreation program uh, targeted at uh, kind of low-income, high-risk students. And basically it's a two-month course, and they did a two-mile bike ride to the, at the end. Um, Dave, do you want to mention anything about it? Because you were... I mean, if you can get that early immersion, <laughs> and this is a six-week program, right? And they were just so excited. Uh, it, was, it was, I would say, and, and Hans is like, let's try and scale this up. If we can re recommend this as a best practice, let's scale it up. If, and likewise, with Heidi uh, and, and Tracy's work and, and we with Waka, let's figure out how to scale that up. Did, did you go back and check and see how many bikes are parked in front of the school? Yeah, so the idea is basically this is a lot modeled after the um, program in the District of Columbia where they have, I think it's every second or third grader that does, that does bicycle education. So this is the pilot, trying to figure out what makes sense for Montgomery County, if we can rotate it around, if it can be part of the, either health or uh, PE program as well. So this is the first year of that program. So that's kind of the safe route to school part. Yeah. You get them. You, you, you get you get them early. That's true, I mean, That's something that came out of that Street Smart VR challenge. We had a little kid who was behind the wheel, and he had the VR headset on. And when he took it off, he said, "That kid walking the sidewalk was like me when I walked to school." And you recognize that what it was like. When you're like, "Oh shoot, there's the kid." Just the idea is that we right. can draw the same situation. As we're thinking about vision for the county and thinking about the future that we want for the county, we want more people not in cars and for climate change reasons, but also for, for uh, increasing accessibility and mobility. And you know, for this to be a pilot program is all well and good, but in the Netherlands, every second or third grader gets rigorous bicycle education and it's a country of bike riders. If yeah. we don't have, if we don't take it seriously to spend money on this, instead of some of the other stuff we're spending money on, then we're never going to get past that hurdle. And a lot of people in the more dense areas are, are going to be higher poverty areas where they don't have private cars, and we're building the bike routes. We need to be building bicycle capacity <coughs> of kids in public schools. To me, this is uh, absurd that we are still at the stage where it is a tiny pilot, however great yeah. it is. And I would like you know, I noticed earlier you were showing what the, the this program of people on the street, that was a cool program. You gave out 250 uh, backpacks, it said. Yeah. Now, I mean, that's a nice gimme, but it's got very little to do with safety. Yeah. Although, well, 250 kids are reflecting. <laughs> yeah. Give them reflective tape or to put on their, but I'm just saying, like, where the money is going, and it's a limited amount of money. Mm -hmm. Uh, a very small quantity of the engineering budget might be enough for this to be a serious county yeah. program. Yeah, I mean, put that up when we think about writing the equity, equity framework, that could be something that we say. If, if, we're, if we really want to do equity and encourage bicycling and safe cycling education or some of the engineering money, we could recommend as a group say that it should be going towards uh, schools.
take the one there. We, we get we get a lot of money from Maryland Highway Safety Office, um, and it is, it's the grant application process where we make our grant. Yeah, we're also looking at adding traffic gardens where kids can learn a safe environment outside about you know stopping and starting and traffic lights as well. Head bike safety garden, yeah. Hey, Lauren. And I'm sorry, I'm distracting the education. I'm not, but, but just curious, a quick question. Is, if all this uh, outreach that you're doing, um, you talked about different targets, is there any targeted outreach of specifically related to disability, whether it's to uh, people like pedestrians with disability, which could be, I guess, wheelchairs or people with hearing or vision loss, or mm -hmm. about, about how to act safely in traffic situations or to drivers? Um, maybe, maybe the outreach you're already doing kind of with you know, safe safe driving habits, it would also cover people with disabilities, but there are some specific yeah. issues. But I think when you think about even Street Smart, I don't think we have anything in the Street Smart package that has a person with a assisted device using it in the in the images. It's usually younger folks, so I think that's something that's a it's a huge gap that we have. In the walk-on that was done in Newton, we had um, quite a number of people. Um, uh, I some sort of visual impairment. Uh, there were people and wheelchairs. There were people with wheelchairs, people with canes, people with dogs. And uh, we made sure that at least one of them was in each of the, the groups. We do end up meeting a lot with those groups one-on-one, um, -on -one, but as far as, as, like Wade said, as far as the advertising and the outreach. And it's probably here. a smaller group, so you, you got to yeah. yeah. Well, I, and I think, I think we need to do better, because I mean, we have a separate, um, Community Advisory Board for Persons with Disabilities, and they um, currently are advocating against the bicycle bicycle lanes because they don't think that they are accommodated enough to persons using transit vehicles or getting in and out of wheelchairs. So, um, better engagement with those folks in the beginning, middle, and end is really important because you know we don't live in those use those materials, so we have to figure out how to make it work for everyone. on to, to your comments about the, uh, the bicycles at the elementary school age to, uh, I'm thinking that if, if there were those dedicated, I'm actually on the other side, I think those dedicated bike lanes, if you're riding a bike, they're actually so much better than any other asphalt, whether it's a sidewalk or, or a road, being in the dedicated lane is, is, uh, you know, is way better. If, they, if there were dedicated roads, uh, lanes going up to the elementary school, so the kids, even in my neighborhood, which is a very 25 mile an hour, low key, there's sidewalks, there's no place for a bicycle to be. Mm -hmm. And one thing we are working on too with Safe Routes to School is building out like maps. So like you can kind of see like what are safe ways from certain neighborhoods to the school, kind of like route, routing maps. Yeah, you know, if you go to Google Maps, you can already hit the word, yeah. you hit bicycle, it'll give you the best bicycle route possible. Yeah. It doesn't, it, when you're actually in the bicycle, it doesn't, yeah. All right. Um, do you know what the budget was for the pilot program? Who's Ted? Uh, Rec did that, so I don't, I've probably seen the number, but I don't remember. Well, as Fire Rescue's there. bikes, right? Is that their bikes well, yeah. trailer? So, yeah, there's a lot of people involved. So WABA actually did the instruction, I think they did it gratis, um, starting from the far left. Uh, <laughs> um, We've got the rec department actually running the program, and it's part of their Excel Beyond the Bell program that they do at, and it's not just this that they do it. They do a lot of other after school things. Um, and then second to left, we uh, Fire and Rescue Services owns a bike trailer with a number of bikes that they not only use for this, but then we immediately ship them from here to Bells Mill Elementary School for a bike rodeo. So they're pretty much constantly in use. And then we've got the rec department again, another rec department, and then the school principal um, partnering with Oakview. Oakview is kind of a rare boon for us because Carol Pachada, who's the PE teacher there, is trained for bike training, and she has certifications for it, and she's willing to do these programs. Um, so our hope is is that we can have her, in addition to this program, because these kids aren't necessarily only from Oakview Elementary School. They're actually bringing them in from other nearby schools, Eastern, uh, or not Eastern, because that's JV or whatever, but other schools that are nearby that third graders who are part of the EBB program. Um, and then Waba did the instructions, Hans Reamer and his group and uh, Jason Fasto helped kind of grease the wheels for all of it. And then um, DOT also helping with 
bike coordination through fire and rescue and rec department and then also usually with giveaways so in addition so there were six bikes that were given out to the kids afterwards for based on an essay contest but then they were also they were all um given the helmets afterwards so they if they did have a bike at home or if they're going to get a bike or if they're borrowing a friend's that they could have it so right now it's kind of this weird everybody pulling together to make it happen which is well in government it's weird um To do it, like if we were to do this countywide, what would it cost? No, but Miriam Kenyon in DC would know. So I just looked it up on shapeamerica.org, and in the DC program, um, it, the, their budget is two hundred fifty thousand dollars, nine hundred fifty bikes, um, forty one hundred students, and seventy nine schools. And what they do is, instead of buying enough bikes for the entire DCPS system, what they do is they have a certain number. And they rotate it from school to school. Yeah. So by the end of the year, all the schools are covered, and it costs less, and everyone gets some exposure. Um, yeah. And I think it's a really smart idea, both for the change reason that you brought up, but also transportation, and also physical education to combat uh, childhood obesity. So I, I love that system of pilot program. I love the yeah. DC program idea. So. And, and I'll add, that's great. So, for the DC, so for the DC program, they used a ton of volunteers to put the bikes together because the bikes came in pieces. So all 900 and something bikes had to be put together and they literally pulled a bunch of volunteers from the community, from the bike community to put those together. Um, even with the, the you know bike traffic gardens that have now been implemented, there's two now in schools, one in, I think they're both in Ward 7. Um, so one is at uh, Neville Elementary School. So if you get a chance over the weekend, go to Neville Elementary School. It's right off of 295. Um, you should be able to get to their back gate where you actually can see what their traffic garden looks like. So they're doing education there. Um, and that was a partnership with the District Department of Transportation, George Washington University, WABA, and some others. So um, sometimes it's about being creative of working with the hospitals in Montgomery County, because um, even with, you know, we worked on the Vision Zero plan, and I can say GW uh, University was very involved with us. Um, even when we did a youth summit with over 300 high school students, uh, George Washington provided us a surgeon to talk about brain injuries of young people and how lives can be impacted from traffic crashes. So definitely that's another potential partnership are the hospitals. Right, we're a little over schedule, so I'm going to run through these quickly. So, again, we have new, we talked about this last time a little bit and the engineering dis debate where you have these new Hawk signals, RFBs going in. They, you didn't cover those in driver's ed, so how do we talk to people about these? So we do um, targeted e mailings. Well, this is like a postcard, and the front side has the zebra on front waving at the new RFB. This is along Belpre Road, uh, not too far from here. So we send it, put them on doors, do door hangers, to try to explain what happens when you push the button. So... Flat, push the button, it flashes, you can cross, and it'll stop going when you have crossed. This is also a, a same for the Hawk signals. So again, we have a new one just right up the road. So we've been putting out flyers with our um, DOT teams. So one for the pedestrians and then one for the motorists for what they'll see when they uh, interact with the Hawk signal. And all right, I think we're ready for a break. About 10 minutes, so back at Five minutes? All right. Yeah, we're a little behind. So five minutes. So grab some food quick and uh, meet again at 820. All right, so a quick recap from the data we talked about in the first meeting. Again, here's the high injury network. These are the roadways with the highest amounts of severe and fatal collisions. Uh, to be on this map, there are at least five or more severe or fatal collisions uh, from a 2012 to 2016 time frame, and at least one collision per mile per year, so talking about density as well as count. 
And for all severe and fatal collisions, they occurred on only 18% of the road, roadway network if you exclude the interstate. So it's really concentrated on these routes. So again, areas of concern. So here we are up in Aspen Hill, which is why Marin is doing the uh, Aspen Hill uh, Vision Zero study. Uh, Wheaton right here. Uh, this is Rockville Pike uh, and Twinbrook area. Uh, Gaithersburg and then Germantown as well up here. So in terms of the data about who is involved in crashes, so these are the ages of persons killed or severely injured, if you're in the same time frame, 2012 to 2016. So the red marks kind of the outliers in the groups for age-adjusted rates. So for drivers, which is in the upper left corner, it's those younger drivers, um, so novice drivers, and then at the very top are older drivers as well. Kind of, you know, basically goes down until you get to the higher uh, age groups. For pedestrians, we actually see um, Fairly even rates throughout, except for that 20 to 29 age group. Um, again, we talked about like, impairment, so that can be part of it as well, for that 20 to 29 age group. Also, when you think about education, that's actually a really tough age to target because they're out of school, um, may not have started a family, so they're not involved with the schools yet. They're not really involved in the community association, so that's a really hard group to reach out to, so especially where social media or other kind of more creative stuff has to come into it because uh, traditional uh, Channels and outlets don't really reach that target audience. And as we talk with the students, cyclists, that 10 to 19 is slightly over overrepresented compared to their population of the county. For sex, again, I say, say this is a man, men are dumb. Um, so they're slightly overrepresented. The county is about 51% female, 49% uh, male. But then for the drivers, pedestrians, and cyclists, again, the cyclist population tends to be more male dominated anyway. That's why they're much larger. Um, percentage compared to the drivers and pedestrians, but still men are slightly more than their population in terms of crashes. We do not capture race or ethnicity in the crash data. This actually comes from uh, mortality data. It's put together by the uh, state of Maryland and sent to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. So here we see uh, disproportionate rates for black African Americans and Hispanics compared to non-Hispanic whites. So especially large difference between for pedestrians, where Hispanic pedestrians are killed at a rate that's three times higher than non-Hispanic white residents. Uh, similar rates for vehicle occupants as well. And where the high injury network and the demographics meet is what we call our kind of equity emphasis areas. So anything in red is an equity emphasis area that was identified by COG based on the demographics, income, and household characteristics. And as you can see, uh, the darker blue is the higher crash density within that census tract. So you can see a lot of our equity emphasis areas, two things to note. One, how much they overlap with the high uh, crash rates, and most of our equity emphasis areas are along state arterial roadways. So again, as we showed in this one, you know, Wheaton, Germantown, Gaithersburg, uh, getting into Tacoma Langley Park, and that same map looking at it this way, Wheaton with the highest, Twinbrook area, Gaithersburg, Germantown. So that leads us into our activity, yeah. Yeah. This one? That's Piney Branch Road. Yep. So that was actually one of our first. Yeah. Yeah, it's close to the Flower Branch as well. Um, it actually was originally one of our pedestrian high injury networks and also carried over um, as part of our overall high injury network as well. Um, so we've done work on there before, but it's not really sticking yet. So there's still more work to do down there. That's, that's New Hampshire Avenue. Yep. So there's New Hampshire. It's a weird road because it comes in and out of the county here. So and there's like a fatality like right here. So it's technically on Prince George's ledger, not ours. So that leads us into our homework time. So I'll hand it over to you. Yeah. So what we did was um, after last week's meeting, we decided to take a slight step back. Um, and we came up with a vision statement. We had talked about this a little bit. So we have four completely different statements. 
These are based on your words. Uh, redoctored a little bit, but these are based on some of the things that you all said at the first meeting. Um, so just a recap, you know, as we're talking about equity uh, versus equality. So at the first meeting, we talked about how do you define equity um, for Montgomery County's Vision Zero program. And we talked about what does equity look like if we achieve it. And so you all gave a lot of commentary there. And so from that, we came up with four very di different vision statements that you see in front of you. So next slide. This one works. Um, and so just to remember, overall what we're trying to get to is a framework of, you know, similar to the emergency room analogy, of patients come to the emergency room, there's an intake process, a priority is determined based on a decision framework, and then people are processed in the order of that priority. So ultimately, that's what we're trying to do for Vision Zero. Different requests are gonna come in, there's an evaluation process that already exists, but then on top of that, there's a decision framework specifically around equity that helps determine priority. And so therefore, you know, these requests can happen in the order of priority. Um, but what we're doing tonight is before we get into the details, we got some really great feedback from you all. Even with the discussion, we actually have a really great list of different types of metrics, things for the scorecard. But one of the things that our staff was realizing as we were going through it and even talking with Wade, it's like, but what's the vision for Montgomery County? And so that's what we wanna go through tonight is really getting to what is the vision statement? Because what will happen is it'll help us, like some of the metrics that we came up with, we don't wanna measure to measure. I've heard a lot about that today, even when we're talking about education, it's what are we measuring? What are we measuring? How does that measure link back to the problem? Right, that's what I'm hearing a lot of. And so we don't wanna come up with a set of metrics that doesn't relate back to what you all believe is the vision. So I'm mean, gonna each of you take five minutes, read all four statements, feel free to wordsmith or whatever, and then we'll go around the room because I want everyone to give their initial reaction to the four statements. We're eventually gonna get to one by the end of this evening and we can wordsmith and send things out over the, um, the listserv as well. But right now, just read the four statements, see what speaks to you, see what doesn't speak to you, see what's missing, um, and then we'll talk about it as a group and try to get to one vision statement. So I will give you all until 8.30, what time is it? 8.35. So read through, wordsmith. If you don't like any of them, you can write your own. And again, all of these came from what you all said at the first meeting. So we, none of these are our words. Slightly rephrase some of it, but these are all your words. I know, right?
All right, it is 8.35. Does anyone else need another minute? Okay, we'll give you one more minute. <laughs> <laughs> okay all right we are going to do so just initial reactions we'll start in the back row and work our way around initial reactions okay Thank you. Next up. So I kind of like this as a from the teaching center. Mm -hmm. However, I wanted to, I'm trying to work with them in a way that that first part, like where they come to the and then they try to make steps and they're open by allocating funding for the reporting. No. Well, pri um, Montgomery County will eliminate traffic-related deaths and serious injuries by, pri by allocating funding, resources, and education in all cities with priority going to certain demographics in that area. So more of a, you know, changing that wording so that you're making sure you're hitting each city in Montgomery County and then prioritizing it based in the city based on what's important to that city. Uh, yeah, based on these four statements we have, the second one resonates with me the most. I uh, was tinkering with the words a bit also. It's, it's not 100% where I'd like to see it, but I think the idea of being kind of um, um, safe for everybody and uh, um, and uh, and emphasizing uh, uh, to be equitable, where you know where the, where to go, where the need is, rather than that, rather than um, by the demographics. <laughs> That's my Next. Um, oh, yes. Um, so I liked um, the first and second statements the most, um, but I guess quick question. Does active transportation options mean um, like walking and biking? Okay, because um, I wanted to incorporate that in as well. Um, so I combined one and two, essentially. So you're doing more than one, basically, like you're the active transportation options. Yes, so basically I, um, I liked changing prioritizing to allocating. I liked that change, and then I circled um, for safe, equitable, active transportation options, and I stuck that after resources um, in the first statement. So it reads, um, uh, Montgomery County will eliminate traffic-related deaths and serious injuries by allocating funding and resources for safe, equitable, active transportation options uh, in the high injury network, or for communities in the high injury network, which addresses disproportionate burden, and then didn't change any of it uh, after that. Mm -hmm. 
yeah, and I, I, I liked keeping the rest of it because I think it's important to acknowledge the communities that face the disproportionate burden um, because that way we know how to address the education and marketing campaigns and we know um, a little bit more about um, what, where this needs to be done. I'm going to deviate a little bit. I like number three as a starting place, but I like some phrases in the first and the second one. The second one, I like the zero and no car households, you know, because that's people have to walk and bike a lot. And then on the first one, I like the low income, the same type of thing. A lot of people aren't going to be driving. So um, I'm not wordsmithing. I'm just kind of getting ideas in. So I believe a vision statement should state what your final goal is and where you want to be when you're done, not how you're going to get there. So I like I liked, I liked the second one. Um, I, unlike you, I did not like the uh, zero or no car households because I don't think we've ever actually stated that as an objective. It would be a nice byproduct to cut down on carbon emissions, what have you. But instead of that, I would prefer something like... Um, being able to uh, use multiple transportation modes, basically giving people the option on how they want to travel rather than being forced into a car because it's the only safe mode of travel. Okay, so I have um, a few thoughts, and they're just my thoughts, but um, I do strategic planning for a living, so I agree, and one of the things that I wanted to point out is that um, a vision statement um, is um, what you want. Um, and so it should be succinct in, in expressing that. Um, so I agree with your um, first comment. Um, and so when I was reading the, the four draft statements, the first thing that came to mind is this, the vision for vision zero or the vision for equity. And this is the equity task force. So I would expect um, that what we're looking for is centered around equity. So that's just a point, um, something to consider. Um, of the four statements, I. I there are parts of each one that are, are good. Um, I, um, one in four, I think in particular, um, have good elements. Um, I started wordsmithing, um, but I think um, just two things. What, we, what we're talking about here is the decision framework. This is some slide 39. This is a picture of a vision statement. Um, this is a graphical representation um, of this is the end state. We want um, equity to be a part of the decision-making process for how funding is allocated in engineering, education, and enforcement um, for the underserved communities, for low-income house, whatever the right wordsmithing is. But this picture expresses a vision statement. I don't know if it's the right one for this group, but this, ex this expresses a... Um, expresses it very well visually. Um, so I think, yeah, th I think this is a great start and we can play around with the language, um, but maybe um, extract it at a higher level so that it's just more succinct. It's what we want in the end, right? And it's something that we work towards over time. Um, so I guess I wasn't thinking about it so much as a vision statement, even though it says draft vision statement on it. Um, I read well, uh, but I think looking at these four, the the first one spoke to me the most, partly because it mentions the higher injury network, which none of the other ones do, and just I see that's where our problem is, or, or like our greatest needs are. Um, I also like that it calls out um, almost in an educational way who those areas who lives in those areas and who's affected by the crashes more than um, than anyone else. Um, so I like that part of it. Um, I think it's also difficult when we're talking about priorities. You know, it's like when I read each of these, I want to, I'm like, oh yeah, well I want the rec center to be walkable or the school to be walkable, but it is hard to say, like if we're saying we want to prioritize funding, you know, if you start saying everything is a priority, it's hard to then prioritize anything um, because nothing becomes a priority. So that was just my thought in terms of kind of mashing these together in some way. I guess I like number one as well. Um, the only real things that I thought might be worth changing were uh, eliminating the non-white altogether. I don't see your need for that, quite honestly. I think that it's accomplished by the other key component of low-income households, but uh, also 
um, at the uh, the end there. I didn't see any data on people with disabilities. Maybe I missed it. I did miss one of the sessions, so it could be that I just missed that. And I thought that maybe replacing that with uh, more people walking and biking might, um, or more people self-propelling ultimately, like might be a benefit. But that's all I had. <laughs> I kind of echo a lot of the comments <clears throat> already stated. One, one's good, but I like the allocating and the prioritized uh, edits that were suggested. Um, a little bit more inclusive uh, in, instead of calling out the white people. Uh, <laughs> I'm not sure we're going to get buy-in, but I think the equity is a how. Uh, the Vision Zero is what. Uh, and, and you're not going to get adoption. I mean, if it, it turns out that uh, you know all the resources go to Bethesda, uh, you know how how is that equitable? Um, and yet, you know, we 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 have a meaningful reduction in, in severe uh, crashes, uh, you know, and, and damage to people and, and lives saved. But if, if it's not equitable, then I'm not sure that that that's what we want. Uh, it's it's but it, it's got to be part of the equation within Vision Zero. I think these are overcomplicated, and a lot of the phrases are vague. Like I circled high injury network. Now we know what that is. Um, burden. People define that a lot differently. Um, active transportation options. No car households. Pedestrian destinations. All of these phrases are very vague um, and can be interpreted really differently. So I think it needs to be uh, much more simplified. Um, I appreciate your description of taking that picture and putting it into words. And then I just wrote, um, at the Vision Zero presentation uh, that was held up at a school in Germantown, someone said, Vision Zero is moving people through areas the safest way. So pedestrians, cyclists, walkers, drivers, all of them. And so I think we're missing that piece and then putting the equity part into it. And so I think we were thinking a little bit similar. So I would get away from all of the this this list of definitions that are vague and just get a real simple vision zero definition with the equity piece applied. Uh, my initial reac uh, reaction was um, as well that our vision statement needs to be more high level. I immediately wanted to ask whether the vision zero people have a vision statement already because we are the equity task force below another group, right? So then maybe we should know what that is well, I mean, imagine it's zero deaths and zero. Yeah, and serious, zero deaths and zero. And serious I mean, injuries. Vision is vision statement is vision zero, which is the elimination of serious and fatal crashes. So I'm gonna completely agree that equity has to be part of our vision statement as the equity task force. And then what I thought was that all of these statements really. A lot of parts of it needs to go into our scorecards because these are actually the things that we need to work on the for the metrics for our f scorecard. So to combine what you're about to do with the idea of like, simplify this because other parts go into the Yes, scorecard. that's right. I think I s see this a little bit differently from the simplifiers um, because I agree that the Vision Zero vision has been defined and the purpose of this exercise is, defi is to define what equitable efforts would look like. And, uh, and I thought that there were a couple of things not quite expressed there yet. One, that um, the input and direct work with communities uh, and hearing directly from people is a key component of equitable and inclusive change. And um, two, that, um, that this is about um, transportation options and not just Vision Zero standing alone because it could be very safe to get someplace but the transportation options was the key component of our first night's discussion so mm -hmm. I made a stab at what a statement might look like that would go with the Vision Zero statement. 
To achieve its Vision Zero vision, Montgomery County works closely with community residents and prioritizes funding and resources to high injury network areas with high population density and high dependence on public transportation and walking, addressing the disproportionate burdens of inadequate transportation in low income communities. Um, so when I looked at it, one of the things I noticed is that all four statements start with the same line and a half uh, about eliminating traffic deaths and serious injuries by priori prioritizing funding and resources. Um, and I don't have a problem with that, but I didn't feel that all of the sub-elements really go directly to that. Uh, so to me, um, what relates to that is focusing the funding and resources on locations, not communities, but specific locations that are high injury. So in the high injury network, uh, with an emphasis placed on locations that are either low income or have been underserved. Uh, but in addition to that, what some of the other things get to and I think uh, Jessica got to this in, in her suggestion too, uh, is another overarching um, goal or vision, which is to improve the county's pedestrian and bicycle network by prioritizing funds and resources to enable more people to walk and bike safely and comfortably with an emphasis on destinations, where people live, where people go, um, and, you know, examples can be provided, um, and locations that are either low income or underserved. So that's my suggestion. Great, thanks. I guess uh, not much more to say at this point at the end of the, uh, but, I, but I, I thought many people had outstanding comments, but I, I guess I was drawn to number one uh, to, to begin with, um, because I did think it was important to, to emphasize both the um, High, in, high injury network, which I agree could be said in a more, not not as such a te technical way, but um, emphasizing sort of the areas that are that have um, historically had um, higher injury rates, but also the populations that are maybe historically burdened um, or affected. Just like your your slides that you had uh, in your recap at the end there, where you had the the maps and how they kind of um, came together. So I mean, I, I just and, and I also feel like. I kind of agree with a few comments that were, were made about the um, some of the other goals about getting people out of their cars or you know p promoting bicycling. I think those are awesome goals, and and I, I don't drive because of visual problems, and I love to run and, and bike too. So um, I think those are good things, but I don't really feel that that's the charge for our our group here. I mean, I feel like it's more like accepting what what transportation modes people are using, but trying to reduce or eliminate the uh, the friction between them. And then, uh, you know, promoting biking or, or walking to be a, a separate group's uh, charter. So, I mean, I guess I would sort of go with number one, but maybe try to reduce the, the uh, details and the, the, the uh, technical nature of some of the terms and just talk about, you know, prioritizing funding to places with higher, um, you know, higher injury rates or something and, and populations that have been especially affected. So. I didn't have enough time to look at it. Uh, I took parts of number two and added it to one to read, Montgomery County will eliminate traffic-related deaths and serious injuries by prioritizing funding and resources to communities in the high injury network, which we know includes equity areas, which address disproportionate burdens on high population in high population density areas and on low-income households, non-white people, youth, seniors, and persons with disabilities. These resources should fund safe and equitable transportation options. Thank you. Um, so one, if you guys want to hand us your paperwork after you, you can. Um, so what I've heard, um, and I heard a bunch of head nods, so um, just focusing on key phrases. So what I've heard, and please correct me if I'm wrong, that you all like using the word allocating versus prioritizing. I like both words. You like both. Okay. What was it? I'm sorry, say that again. So replace, I thought I heard, replace allocating uh, in lieu of prioritizing for second. Like and then prioritizing 
Got it. Got it. Got it. Okay. Okay. So you're saying determine the allocation? I just think that the word equity should really have been our vision. Sure. Um, how do we do it? I mean, I think all those things that people are saying are important, but I think it should be, you know, we will look at the allocation of funding by um, after looking at equity as the main driver. I, I don't know how to, you know. What if you say something like, you know, providing equity regardless of social economic like instead of listing all the, you mm -hmm. can eliminate and wrap it all into one, regardless of. Do we need to define equity in the vision statement? I mean, that could be defined. We have notes from the first meeting about defining equity for this plan, so we can build that out as well. We talked about, we had two questions in the first meeting where it was. Yeah, How do you define equity and what does, what does equity look like if we achieve it? So there's kind of the vision statement and there's kind of like the overall outcome measure, you know, we talked about how the rates would kind of be similar as they go down towards zero was kind of the consensus from the first meetings. Yes. Absent the kind of delineation of every group that might need um, protection, if we just, you know, follow the, the blocks as, uh, you know, so the, the priority is according to need um, rather than Paragraph one, and I've heard this in the county, uh, where we, we get to prioritize it, funding and resources through an equity lens to communities. It, I mean, we've, we've heard a lot about through an e equity lens at that point, that phrase captures where, you know, it, it, yes, <laughs> that's kind of key. Let's state it up front. Uh, and, and I've heard that from the county executive and the county council. It's kind of, you know, repeating that. I'll push back a little bit on that. So equity, come on, Dave, let's go. <laughs> um, so, so one thing is that's dangerous about equity. If you just kind of throw the word out there, is it can mean so many different things. Because you talk about racial equity, um, you know, age and equity. There's a lot of different versions of equity. So if you just say um, we're gonna worry about racial equity, it's just a very different type of framework versus you know we talked about in the first meeting. We talked about age, gender. Um, disability and uh, economic as well. So being able to somehow say that because equity is becoming like innovation where you can just say, oh, we're doing innovation now. And it, it loses any sort of tangible way because if you say, well, we're equity now, we're about what you need. Well, the groups that already get what they need are gonna say, I'm not getting what they need. Exactly. Yeah. So hand in the hand. Um, sorry, so I just wanted to clarify how the vision statement was going to be used because there was, um, you know, there was some discussion about like there is a vision statement for Vision Zero and how the equity Vision Zero statement would be used. And because I mean, I do think that this is like kind of almost more like um, an objective or a plan of how to get there rather than the vision statement as you brought up. Um, it's kind of like this is how we get at equity by prioritizing these things. But um, so I'm just, how is this statement going to be used? Is a Okay. Right? And then, you know, we'll have some type of a metrics that comes with it so that when the next plan, when Montgomery County does their 10 year plan, it's, this is the foundation that builds that plan. Okay. So, as you know, so even as we're talking today, we talked about education. We said, well, why are you measuring this versus that? Well, so then now Montgomery County is going to say, okay, so based on this equity framework, this is what. 
what we mean by education. This is how we, when we do our ten-year plans, and this is how we do funding, and this is how we do engineering projects. When we do enforcement, this is the lens that we are looking through in order to make those decisions. Right. Yeah, and I guess for me, none of these statements speak to that at all. Um, kind of how some people were bringing up that this is just different than a vision statement, and I think that these are helpful um, in terms of like how do we reach equity, but it, it yeah, it's it's like harder to connect it to a vision statement um, in terms of even defining equity, as you said, because there are many different definitions um, of what pe we mean when we say equity. So I, I think we're, yeah, just re really quickly, a point of consideration as you all are revising the feedback. Um, maybe a vision statement isn't appropriate. Maybe that's not what's needed. Maybe what's needed is a definition. And I think, uh, um, you know, this is trying to, you know, we had a really good discussion around what does equity mean in the county. And so so maybe, um, maybe we need a vision statement. Maybe not. Um, you know, but it, it, if it's just the framework around how equity decisions will be made, that's a decision framework. And that's something completely different than a vision statement. So. And that seems like maybe more, more, for, more helpful, yeah. yeah. I can put an example of how helpful a decision framework for funding allocation because it's very different than a decision statement. I think that I hear a consensus that we already have a vision, and that's vision zero. And what you asked us to help the county do is figure out what it means to achieve Vision Zero through an, e an equity lens. And so, which is, which is why the, the feedback that you're getting is all about where the resources should go. And I hope I, I'm restating this because I might be the only one who brought it up and I hope you heard it, is that it's not just about where the money goes, but it's about how the decisions are made about where the money goes, that people who are underserved and underrepresented um, have an opportunity to have a voice in those decisions. And I would like to see that captured as part of what our vision for an equitable approach would be. Um, so that's why I come back to saying that to achieve Vision Zero with an in an equitable fashion, Montgomery County will, would be a better lead into this than we will do it. By the, so. Like, like you're itching to say something. All right, so, um, so like I said, we'll work on the, the great discussion. Um, a lot of great feedback. We'll take that and develop a something to, for the chew on for the next meeting. Our next meeting is that person does not care about Vision Zero apparently out there. Um, <laughs> wow. Um, next meeting will be in two weeks uh, in Gaithersburg Library, and we'll be discussing educate or sorry enforcement. Um, this the twin for education, and we will be. Uh, finalizing the, this vision-ish statement and working on a framework as well for you guys all to, to chew on and then we will wrap. <laughs> that is the eight, 18th. It's a Tuesday. Yes. That is the last one on the schedule so we'll take... <laughs> yeah, so, so after that meeting we'll basically take everything we've gotten for the four meetings draft something, uh, have like an open comment period with a public, public hearing for the group and for anyone else who wants to be involved in that kind of looking at the final draft of the document. Right, that's why we said we took a step back this time. We need to talk about yeah. what we actually want to, yeah. Yep. All right, thanks everyone.